Hey everyone, it's Y again, and for this video, I want to take a look at the recently released Doom plus Doom 2 port and see just how much of an upgrade it is compared to its previous counterpart, which was sold as two separate games. The previous ports for the first Doom games were released in 2019 and leveraged Unity as its shell, while the new enhanced ports implement the Kex engine. Now that we know a little about what's being compared here, let's see what enhancements this port has to offer. For starters, it has this wonderful game selection screen of the included games that you can launch into. They're organized by release date and include the cover art and description for each game. While you could play these add-ons in the Unity version, it required a little bit of legwork first. You'd have to go and download them, which means you need an internet connection. Once downloaded, you'd have to go into the installed mods and activate it in order to play it. When done playing, you'd have to go in and deactivate the current active one and repeat the process to play any other mods. The games will run at 60 frames per second at 1080p resolution on all platforms, while the Xbox Series consoles, PC, and PlayStation 5 are all capable of 120 frames per second at 4K resolution. Here's a few comparisons where you can see the visual differences between the old and new ports. Both versions were captured running on an Xbox Series X. You'll notice that objects in the distance are now much more recognizable with the higher resolution. It also does a great job at cleaning up those jagged edges seen on diagonal lines. Ceiling lights used to have this distracting flickering effect where they disappear and reappear repeatedly. This issue has been immensely improved upon thanks to the higher resolution. And just for fun, here's a comparison of the original resolution to the maximum resolution in a four player split screen match. It's not just the visuals that receive some TLC. The enhancements also extend to gameplay options as well. When selecting a level, you now have an option to enable various difficulty modifiers. These modifiers are a new addition that let you play levels in new ways. It's worth noting that the Unity port didn't have these modifier options, though it did have an additional difficulty called Ultra Violence Plus. You won't find a difficulty with that name in the enhanced port, but you can still replicate it by enabling the Vast Monsters and Use Multiplayer Items difficulty modifiers. Now I can't talk about this port without mentioning the Legacy of Rust expansion that comes with the package. Without going too much into detail, this newly created campaign includes 16 maps with new demons and new weapons. A good amount of care has been given to the multiplayer in this release. The 2019 port only had support for local multiplayer, whereas this one has online support for both deathmatch and co-op with up to 16 players in each. So if you and 15 other people want to tackle a few maps, you're free to do so. Deathmatch includes a tailored map pack specifically for the mode featuring 25 community made maps. The Deathmatch custom settings for both frag limit and time limit have been increased substantially. Before the max frag limit was 25 and the time limit was 15 minutes. Now you can set those up to 99 frags and 1 hour max. Even split screen got some love in this port. The HUD has seen some slight tweaks. Two player split screen now takes up the whole screen, unlike before where it had a background taking up screen space on the sides. Three player has changed the screen layout and removed the background. There's not much to say with the four player since it takes up the whole screen and is more or less the same. A welcomed addition to split screen is the support of up to eight players can now play on the same screen. Sadly, I don't have eight controllers to test this, but it's an option that's available on both PC and the Xbox Series consoles. You can't have a proper enhanced port without some new features. While the original music is still intact, there is an option to swap it out with the fantastic remixes from Andrew Holschult. Here's a small sample of what to expect with both the original and the remixed soundtracks.
What is known as the id vault has been added which contains a whole bunch of resources from Doom and Doom 2's original development. You'll find everything from unused sprites to early iterations of weapons, concept art, and even cut enemies. There's a lot of interesting history in this ID vault, so I recommend checking it out for yourself. While you could play mods in the previous port, it was limited to just developer curated mods. That feature is still present in this port, and is called Featured Mods. Going beyond just that, this port allows modders to upload their mods to a mod browser for all players to download and play. With the exception of the Nintendo Switch sadly, likely due to a policy enforced by Nintendo. Doom has a rich history of mods, so having a way for mod creators to share their mods and for console players to play those mods is a milestone for the series. Next, I want to take a look at how the various options have changed. PC players had it okay, with key bindings in the old port, while the console players got, well, this. A bare bones control screen that had zero customization. Whereas now we have an input options menu with actual customization. A lot of what you've come to expect out of control options is present, including controller bindings. I should also point out that yes, you can indeed play Doom with a keyboard and mouse on consoles. The PC input settings appear to be identical to the console settings this time around, with the exception of the first controller being a PC specific setting. The gameplay options wasn't as bad as the controls menu. The PC version even had gyro support for the DualShock 4 controller. It too has had a considerable upgrade in options. Not seen here is that gyroscopic aiming is supported on Switch, PlayStation 4, and PlayStation 5, as well as PC. Another great addition is the crosshair is now customizable, whereas before you can only toggle it on or off in the older port. There's a new multiplayer option settings menu, which offers some nice customization for players. Here's how the split screen direction settings works, in case you were wondering. The audio sound options have a few new additions to better support the new features. There's the preferred soundtrack and the fallback soundtrack, which changes how the music sounds. I'll give you a quick listen on what to expect out of these options. The video and display settings weren't too different between console and PC. PC just had a few additional options, which are standard for PC. Here are the PC specific options for this port. Again, nothing you wouldn't expect. The display options is where the meat is. The options themselves match between console and PC. I'm a big fan of these options, since they let players decide if they want a few more modern enhancements or are more faithful to its original release look. The screen size is a fun one. You can increase it so that the HUD doesn't waste so much space or even shrink it down so that the game screen becomes tiny. There's a few more returning options along with a new option called Auto Map Line Thickness which can be quite useful when playing on a smaller portable device that needs thicker lines for easier visibility. This time around, there's a handy set of accessibility options made available. High contrast text removes the background to make the text easier to read. The menu typeface can be changed to modern if you're not a fan of the original font. Screen flash effects can be disabled completely. The notification message time controls how long the message in the upper left hand corner appears when picking up items. It can be set to zero if you don't want to see the message at all. There's also a few communication related settings as well. There's now a language option menu for easily changing the language. Achievements are a new feature for PC players. These achievements are different from the ones seen in the previous port, so these will be treated as a completely new set of achievements. Okay, so that covers all the improvements for this enhanced edition, but unfortunately, there's a few areas that have actually been more of a downgrade in this port. There's a problem that affects controller players specifically, and I can verify that it happens on both PC and on Xbox. 
highly suspect it's an issue on the other consoles as well. The stick dead zone sliders affects not only the dead zone as you'd expect, but also the response curve output. The smaller the dead zone is set, the more aggressive the response curve becomes. The larger the dead zone is set, the more relaxed the curve gets. This causes players to have to strike a balance between the size of their dead zone and how much precision they want in their light joystick movements. This appears to be an issue with how Night Dive Studios implements their controller setup with the Kex engine. Each and every game I've tested that uses the Kex engine has this issue. That being Quake, Quake 2, and Rise of the Triad Ludicrous Edition. This negatively impacts how the game plays for controller players, which diminishes the overall feel of the game. In my opinion, a two-part solution to this problem would be a good way to handle it. Make it so that the stick dead zone slider no longer affects the response curve, and create a new input setting, something called maybe stick response, that has a slider for how quickly the stick input registers to 100% output. An odd change in this new port is the lack of ability to select campaign maps for deathmatch. Here you can see the campaign maps are available for deathmatch, while in the new port it's restricted to just a few select maps. Another issue I'd like to bring up is that the previous port had this handy cheat menu, which made it very convenient to activate cheats. You would simply just pause the game, open the cheat menu, and select the cheat you'd like to activate. That menu is gone from this port, requiring you to memorize the cheat codes and type them in into a keyboard. You can still do this on consoles, assuming you have a keyboard, but it's not the most convenient. On the Unity port, the load game screen used to provide the difficulty setting of the save file when clicking on this question mark. That information is no longer presented in the Kexport's load game menu. And for the last topic I want to touch on in this video are some suggestions that I feel would improve this port. It's just a few things that have come to mind while playing this port in no particular order. The mod browser's current implementation leaves a lot to be desired. It makes it quite hard to find specific mods. You can only sort through mods by total subscribers, updated time, the mods you have subscribed to, published time, and title. From there, you can choose to order them from descending or ascending order. There is no way to search for a mod, only sorting them and flipping through pages of mods. A quick way to launch into the mod after downloading one would also vastly improve the user experience. Instead, you're currently having to back out of the mod browser and select the play option and find your mod you've downloaded in the list of subscribed mods. Browsing online multiplayer matches lacks any sort of sorting or filtering. You just have to wade through a big list of what's available and hope you find something you like. I'd like to see the ability to filter out either deathmatch or co-op matches, as well as being able to sort by ping and by amount of players in a match. Various source ports include a screenshot of the game when choosing to load a saved game. It's a great feature that helps make it easier for players to keep tabs on each save file. The game would greatly benefit from better online multiplayer mod support. It doesn't have any on consoles and only a limited amount on PC. I say limited amount because you can launch the game into a mod, but any player who tries to join you will fail to do so if they haven't launched into that same mod. It's quite frustrating to see a mod you want to play only to have it crash the game. Adding restrictions to prevent incompatible mods from being uploaded to the mod browser would help cut down the amount of content that players have to trudge through when searching through mods. The full screen HUD doesn't have great widescreen support. All the HUD elements are positioned near the center of the screen to accommodate the 4x3 aspect ratio. It'd be nice to see an option that lets us push the HUD elements out further to the edge of the screen in widescreen mode. And while on the topic of HUD features, a HUDless option would be a nice addition as well. CRT screens were the standard back in the 90s when these games were created. They were designed with CRT screens in mind, 
but more likely than not, players today aren't going to be playing this port on a CRT screen. A CRT filter would be a welcomed addition to help preserve the game's original intended look. Night Dive has even implemented such a feature in their port of Power Slave Exhumed, so I don't see why Doom can't get the same treatment. Light diminishing is a part of how Doom handles lighting. Players today might not appreciate it, so an optional toggle to smooth out that banding could be a great addition, as an option to more modernize Doom's appearance. The source port, GZ Doom, has a feature called Banded SW Light Mode that does just this. When the setting is enabled, it smooths out that light banding. If possible, an optional setting like this would make a great addition to this port. The deathmatch in-game scoreboard is pretty basic. It only displays the players and their score. Some additional information, such as time remaining and frag limit, would be appreciated. The volume mixing of the soundtracks needs some work. Listen to just how much louder the remix soundtrack is compared to the original. One feature that got lost in this enhanced port is the co-op friendly fire. A difficulty modifier to re-enable this behavior would be a good way to restore this feature. I can't help but to notice the omission of Sigil 2 in this game's included content. Sure it could be played by downloading it from the featured mod list, but it seems like such an odd thing to leave out, especially when they've included the first sigil. As you can see, this version's strength lies within its convenience, cross-platform support, and accessibility. It doesn't quite check all the boxes that I'd like it to, but it is off to a strong start, and it's certainly an improvement over the 2019 Unity port. Hopefully, in the near future, it can receive an update, or even a few, to really cement its place as a solid port to these genre-defining games. And that about does it for this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, consider hitting that like button and subscribing to my channel for even more content. Thanks for watching, and have a good one.